Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I really want to look under the hood of the internet with you a little bit today and uh, talk about some governance-related shortcomings that uh, we should all think about. Um, this talk is based on the experience and the ongoing work of KC Claffey and myself. KC is the director of CADA, the Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis, based at UCSD in uh, San Diego. I've already been introduced. So if we're looking at tech news and also what's happening at this very conference, we see a lot of uh, application layer and application layer plus type risks and issues, right? We just had election security, we talked about disinformation, um, and if we've read all the news, right, we are aware of uh, privacy issues when it comes to companies using your images for facial recognition. What's interesting about these things, um, apart from the fact that we haven't really solved them, is also that they all rely on data being transferred via the internet. So as I said, I want to go under the hood of the internet a little and unfortunately remind you it's not that good under there either. And when I say under the hood, um, I'm going to focus on the governance of the three fundamental layers that requires some level of governance uh, to guarantee consistent and reliable interpretation, and that is addressing, routing, and naming. So, as I've already alluded to, these fundamental functions matter profoundly because everything we do on the internet, all our nice apps, uh, rely on the integrity, availability, and confidentiality of this underlying infrastructure. As many of you will know, uh, all this dates back to the 70s and 80s, when it was a US government funded research project that escaped the lab. We can't really say it escaped the lab too early because it wasn't actually built or designed to do the socially fundamental functions we wanted to perform today. Just think banking or uh, medical communications. Obviously, right, we can't say that these aspirations were in no one's mind, at least not by the 1990s people were thinking about these use cases. But when the 1990s came around, the US government, which had been the primary administrator and funder of the internet infrastructure thus far, perceived a higher order challenge. And what they did in terms of policy changed the course of history and impacts profoundly on the regulation and standards landscape uh, we have today. So what was that? At the time, the US government had taken about 40 years to break up the telecom monopoly, and it seems they didn't want to do that again. Um, and so they were trying to explicitly foster a competitive and innovative information technology industry. So amid accusations that the US-funded research and educational networks were competing with an internet industry that was just emerging, um, the US government launched strategic industrial policies trying to promote competition and innovation in the emerging internet transport and domain name industries. But as I said before already, uh, addressing, routing, and naming require a level of centralized governance. So the US government and technical community cooperated and created a nonprofit corporation that was supposed to be the steward uh, of the addressing and naming systems. Quickly going into tech, even though this is the governance panel, um, in addressing, we usually don't want to have machines with the same IP address. Um, that usually leads to problems, even though there are some exceptions to this rule. Um, you want your autonomous system numbers to be unique. Um, and when it comes to names, right, if you type in usenix.org, you do want to uh, arrive at the same service or site every time and from wherever you are. So the result of this technical need plus the laissez-faire self-regulation approach um, that was chosen, we got ICANN, the International Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers. So ICANN is a fun beast. It's not just an administrator. It is a policy forum that makes the rules for the domain name system. 
specifically for generic top-level domains. Those are the .coms and .nets, and not those that are country codes, recognizable because they only have two letters, .us, .uk, .de. Um, I want to reiterate, creating ICANN in this way of serving this function uh, was serious industrial policy and, and hadn't really been done before. So, ICANN policy making, in turn, is also a fun little beast. It follows the multi-stakeholder approach, and that also hadn't really been done before in that fashion. And what they talk about and what they do is, uh, for example, deciding and um, uh, creating rules on what goes into the who is, and then what is accessible or not accessible. This is surely something some people in this room have dealt with. Um, and if you go to an ICANN meeting, you kind of see this in action, right? You meet industry, you meet government, you meet civil society. But if you look around, you will find that the domain name industry, the contracted parties, are extremely overrepresented. Um, so and for the lucky ones who don't know what this all means, contracted parties include registries that run the TLDs like .com or .net, and registrars that broker um, uh, registrations uh, for registrants. The registrant, that is you when you feel you really need your name.ninja to link to your website. So existing alongside ICANN, right, we have a technical standards community that deals with the kind of lower level issues. Um, so the IATF spent significant efforts since the 90s to develop technical solutions or patches or whatever you want to name it to the underlying naming and routing protocols. Um, for example, cryptographic authentication has been added to these layers. However, and this is again no news to this uh, room, not all security issues are purely technical and not all security issues can be solved or addressed technically, at least not efficiently and effectively. So, in addition, it appears that the engineers, particularly in the beginning, did the parts they could do, but they tended to not consider or misjudge the political economy in which uh, their solutions would be embedded or deployed in. So, going back to what I just said, not uh, all issues are best addressed by technical um, approaches or solutions. And sometimes it's better to go through management. Essentially, the levels beyond the standard layers of the OSI model, so what we call layers 8, 9, and 10, users, organizations, and governance. So to give you a simple example, if um, I register a domain with a registrar, what checks do they have in place to make sure that what I'm doing is legitimate? Then, there are various issues that can't be solved with uh, protocol changes, but have to do with how things are managed on a technical um, or organizational level. So now we're at best practices. So the IATF and ICANN Security Stability Advisory Committee and many others wrote various best practice documents over the years, um, essentially giving you guidelines of how to do things well. But best practices, they're often not deployed um, because they're pricey. And if we look at the domain market uh, that I'm focusing on in particular, um, it's extremely competitive when it comes to price. So security um, costs and you don't, uh, you don't want to spend. In a, as a result, our fundamental core systems, including the DNS and routing, do not provide sufficient controls to really uphold integrity, availability, and confidentiality. And while technologically speaking, we do have options, we're often lacking the layer 8, 9, 10 solutions, as well as the incentives to deploy what is already available. This quote's from 2004, by the way, just so everyone notices. Many voices, right? This includes law enforcement, companies, consumer protection champions, and others have called for a change of how, how internet governance is handled and approached in this like internet governance and icon sphere. 
But unfortunately, I have to tell you that there is a problem with ICANN and other bodies like it. It is technically open to all. We can go. But meaningful participation requires time and money. And naturally, large vested interests like the corporations that deal with the DNS space that offer services will be heavily involved in and try to steer the governance uh, processes because these impact on their operating environment and their profit margins. Unsurprising and can't blame them. However, the non-profit driven stakeholders, academics, uh, civil society, consumer protection agencies, they don't have the resources to invest in this and they're just less well able to have their interests represented and to shape policy. Interestingly, to a lesser extent, even large corporations who are not these kind of contracted parties, DNS um, players, um, tell me they struggle to have their voices heard at ICANN because the DNS stakeholders are so present and so overwhelming. And the effect of this imbalance is that the concerns and the needs of the billions of internet users and many people who offer products are not considered as much as they should be at this fundamental level. Now going into specifics a little bit. Uh, so various ICANN review teams have raised issues that relate to this governance problem that I just outlined, including SSR2, the second security, stability, and resiliency review team that KC and I are both part of. So for example, if you uh, look into things, you will find that ICANN contracts have close to no language addressing systemic abuse. By that, uh, abuse, we here mean um, criminal domain registrations for phishing, malware, et cetera, et cetera. I know some definitions go further. As an example, um, Alpnames, Gibraltar-based company, and they were responsible um, as a registrar for more than 50% of the new general TLD domains that Spam House blacklisted. On your own, that's, that's, a, that's a feat. Um, it folded, lucky us. But not because anyone stopped them, but because they stopped paying their fees. What does I can say? I quote, <clears throat> there are potential limitations on the actions that I can or can take in addressing DNS infrastructure abuse. Neither the registry agreement nor the 2013 registrar accreditation agreement has enforceable provisions prohibiting or authorizing sanctions against systemic DNS infrastructure abuse. In addition, the RA and ICANN policies as currently defined do not authorize ICANN hook to require registries to suspend or delete potentially abusive domain names. Bummer. Um, at the same time, right, I don't want to be too much of a downer here. Um, not all is bad. So ICANN's Octo team, the office of the CTO, helps um, various parties with deploying DNSSEC, which in turn helps ensuring integrity. They coordinate with law enforcement. They uh, take part in anti-abuse fora, uh, et cetera, et cetera. ICANN as a whole helps funding and does support various projects and initiatives to uh, work on threats to the internet. Um, but unfortunately, the overall policy imbalance I am talking about here is systemic. You can't solve this by outreach and uh, cooperation. It's also not some kind of conspiracy within a system that otherwise works. It is system inherent. Um, and just to note, again, not to be uh, too much of a downer, there are some bad actors that we actually can identify, but also many that, that are not. Additionally, we are facing an issue across technology. Um, and this is that the impact of technology on society is messy. It's a challenge for technical standards bodies and companies. Um, in the past, right, if we go back uh, a few years, technical standard making was about making stuff work. And now 
It's much more about ethics and how these standards will impact in different countries all over the world. And rest assured, whatever you do or not do, someone will be shouting at you and be hating on you. So before I move on to the uh, fixes, I want to reiterate that this hands of approach that was taken um, has facilitated uh, technical innovation. Uh, competition and technological progress have driven down the price of resources, like hosting, domains, et cetera, et cetera. However, right, while the near general availability and the low prices do benefit everyday users, they have also got an unintended consequence, and that is enabling inevitable elements of the human condition, crime, that are often kept in check by law and regulations. Solutions, now it gets fun. So it is no surprise that due to the technically open but heavily stratified nature of internet governance, goals like public security and safety have often been neglected in the current environment. Provisions for security would drive down profits of the parties that are invested in the governance space ICANN. Um, thus, if you're a proponent of security, you struggle to tackle these issues through the existing uh, policy avenues. In addition, we even lack the data and the insight, and thus uh, interest bodies and independent researchers have trouble to comprehensively study and use security, the relationship between policy, pricing, costs, and abuse. So, calling for regulatory oversight has become more common due to what some see as market failures, but that raises a number of empirical questions. What are the biggest security threats to the internet infrastructure? How can we understand, if not quantify, the effectiveness of the different risk mitigation strategies, or even to what extent uh, defenses have been successfully deployed? Let's take a totally different angle on this. What is government supposed to do? And of course, which government? <laughs> Regulatory oversight is not a simple thing we can just create and be done with, right? We're talking about naturally and necessarily global uh, regulation and policy making, assuming we want to keep the internet global. And are there any, yeah, there are not really any examples of uh, you know, how to do this. They're not really templates. And we cannot just fix this in a talk like the one I'm giving you right now, but what I'm trying to do is to urge you to think about these issues because we really have to. So who should be in charge? We could do government-backed regulators, right? Um, but I can transition the way from Department of Commerce oversight because it was not considered appropriate for the US government to be technically in charge of this global infrastructure. Other countries have called for states to play the role of internet governance anyway. So the question remains, who should actually control the sphere? Who should select the body that does this oversight, that does the policy making? Whom should they uh, be accountable to? And what should their mission be? So I've been asked to think about how this space would look like if I could use a magic wand to get there. What would we want? Well, I'd like a highly transparent steward that's not beholden to or captured by one specific interest group, be this governments or industry. That steward have to, would have to be paid directly by registrants or users and thus be responsible to them, not a specific interest. We need accountability, proper representation of parties. We want to hear all sides and decision-making processes that do not cut some people out. Security should be upheld, privacy, efficiency, effectiveness of process, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see, there's a lot I want with my magic wand. So, more practically speaking, uh, in the short term, we must recognize that the current lack of data and access undermines our understanding of the status quo. We have to consider that essentially everything relies on data being transferred over the internet. And it's crucial for us to think about baseline protocol level security and the network that we send all our stuff over. And without open and available data, we cannot fully understand the internet and how its protocols work. 
and particularly how they fail. We need independent parties to be able to analyze these core systems, reveal what is happening, and help us to improve the digital road network. In short, we cannot fix the issues we don't know about. In the medium term, we argue that policy fora like ICANN will have to be reorganized to give a stronger voice to consumer protection interests and the independent experts and researchers that support them. One option would be to adopt a parliament-style approach where different groups have a number of seats and they have to form alliances to have enough votes to, to actually pass policy, and this would make it harder for niche interests to dominate as much as they do now. At the same time, final slide, two bigger problems. Lack of funding for many civil society and consumer advocacy groups, and this goes far beyond uh, the ICANN realm. The other is ICANN's financial dependence on the contracted parties. In the long term, we need the regulatory function or at least some form of oversight to be financially independent from the industry it reg regulates. There are options that don't go that far, but you could do that internally. For example, we could add um, systemic abuse provisions to the ICANN contracts and then silo off the compliance function or have it provided externally. We could have more stringent rules about who can join the board and how they have to disclose conflicts of interest. And we could also submit the organization to external third party audits. However, as long as the money flows from a special interest group, the contracted parties to ICANN and not from the registrants to ICANN, the organization cannot gain this independence, which is why this last point is so important. Thank you very much.